another week of worship over the internet. Uh, it's great to have you tuning in week by week. We really do appreciate it. it it's so encouraging as we uh, look at the numbers clicking up on the screen to see many of you uh, watching it on Facebook and YouTube. And we know that others will be watching it during the week or on DVD. It's great to have you. And don't forget to send us your little greetings. It really does encourage us each week to know who's tuning in. One announcement as such this week, and it's just really to repeat something I said last week. No doubt you're still waiting impatiently, impatiently to hear when we'll be opening the doors for you to come back and be here with us. Um, well, the elders will be meeting this week. and uh, Later on this week, we'll be meeting to discuss um, important practical matters with regards to how we move forward on, on this issue. And hopefully in the next week or two, we'll, we will be able to give uh, a roadmap, to use that political phrase, uh, as to how we are going to progress into the future. Uh, and we'll also be sending a letter out. When all the details are finalised, we will contact you by letter as well. But what I want to say again this week is, is please continue to be patient with us and please pray for us as we try to work our way through all the guidance, which is constantly changing. I've received more emails this week as to how things are changing. So please, please be patient. Please pray for us as we read through all the material that is coming from the executive office in Sormont and also from assembly buildings in Belfast. And we will open the doors as soon as it is safe to do so. And it'll be great to have faces to look at, not just the usual three or four that I'm sick looking at uh, over the past three months, but some more of you coming in. It'll be great to see that. But in the meantime, we continue to, to meet in this way uh, and praise and worship our great, faithful, uh, sovereign God. Uh, and this opening song is one that we have sung a few times over the past uh, month or so, a newish one for most of you. But it reminds us that we come to worship a God who is perfect in all of his ways, a God who is all-knowing, a God who is a good, good Father. Searching for it. 
as we come to prayer, I'm going to do what I've done on previous occasions and refer to the Let's Pray material, which is pub- published by uh, Assembly Buildings every week and is available by, available by email. So you can go on the PCI website and check that out if you don't already get it. So I come to pray um, at the start of our service. I'm going to use the words of a prayer that has been written for that material this week. It's a prayer that has been entitled, A Prayer of Thanks for God's Presence with Us on the Journey. So let us come to our good, good Father and pray together. Faithful God, we pause on this unexpected and unchosen path. Somewhere between our Mizpah and Shem, to raise our Ebenezer stone, declaring thus far has the Lord helped us. You have been present with us on this journey, sometimes guiding reliably like a pillar of cloud by day, sometimes spectacularly illuminating like a pillar of fire in the night, always providing like the daily manna in the wilderness drawing forth faith one day at a time. Times we have looked for you in earthquake, wind and fire, but like Elijah at Horeb, mountain of God, you have spoken in the gentlest of whispers and we have found it enough. Like Samuel in the night or Mary in the garden, we have known you speaking our name, calling us to learn from you, to follow you to places to which we have never been before. And you will be present with us as future days unfold. You say, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And we can reply with fresh confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, continue to equip us with everything good for doing your will. Keep on working in us what is pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I've got uh, something with me this week, and I want to talk to you for a few moments. It's been a busy few weeks in our house celebrating. Uh, June is is a busy month. We have two birthdays in the house, uh, and then when it comes to July, we also have a a wedding anniversary. So it's been a busy time over the past few weeks, and there's been quite a few of of, of these things floating around, either uh, birthday bags or or, uh, little parcels wrapped up with nice wrapping paper and cards coming through the door and we all like to get gifts don't we every one of us likes to get a a gift I'm sure there's no one who doesn't enjoy their birthday or Christmas and, and our wedding anniversary and getting something like this handed over to them but what if I were to come to your house on your birthday or Christmas or someone with a nice bag like this and say I have something for you but you've got to give me a fiver first before you can get it. Would that make it a gift? Would it be a present for you? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you don't buy your gift, do you? You don't have to pay for it to get it, get it as a gift. If it's a gift, I give it to you at no cost to you whatsoever. All you have to do is accept it from me and, and receive it and enjoy it. I wonder, you know, if... I look forward to the day when you're all back here sitting on the carpet. And if you were here and I were to ask you, what is your favourite gift? I'm sure you would give me a whole host of answers. Maybe it's your bicycle. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a games console. Maybe you've had a favourite T-shirt or, or clothes. Although I can't imagine that somehow uh, amongst some of you. Uh, I wonder, would it be a, a trip somewhere? Maybe you've had a special holiday or a day out. Uh, maybe it's you've got a new pet lamb or some new hens or something else. Every one of you would tell me what your favourite gift has been. And it would all be very, very different. But what makes it a gift? Well, it's someone giving something to you, as I've said, at no cost. I want to talk about something special, not that comes in a birthday bag, but an amazing gift, far better than anything that that we can receive from our our parents or from our friends or grandparents or aunts and uncles. I want to talk about an amazing gift. And the Bible calls it the gift of eternal life. 
And the person who gives that gift is God himself. The Bible says, and and probably the best known verse in the whole of Scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God is is extending that gift to, to you and me and saying, look, here's something for you. No cost to you. I've paid for it. I'm giving it to you. Will you receive it? And that, what he's given us is the gift of eternal life, knowing that one day we can spend forever with him in heaven. That's the greatest gift of all, because like the stuff we get in these bags, we shouldn't get bored with them, or, or, or they run out, or this is one of our favorite presents in, in our house, this, this box of Ferrero Rocher, and it's amazing it's still in, it's still in the box and not opened. But it doesn't last forever, does it? It'll soon disappear. But the gift that God has for us will never disappear. We will never get bored with it. It will never break. It is forever. And do you know what? It doesn't cost us. Remember what it said? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's how we can have that gift of eternal life. Because Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus went to the cross and he suffered there. And if we just come and say, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I'm sorry for disobeying you, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me. Please, please, may I have that gift of eternal life. He will give it to us. He has promised to do that. So friends, I don't know if you have birthdays coming up. The birthday bag that we use on a Sunday is still lying here. There's still lots of stuff in it. I can't wait to come back and and start sharing that out again. But more importantly than what's in that bag, more importantly than what we have received and what you may receive at birthdays and at Christmas is the gift of eternal life. And God said, here it is. Here it is. It's for you. Will you receive it? Think about that. Talk about about it with your mums and dads. And please don't, don't ignore that wonderful, precious gift that God wants to give us. We're going to sing a song now, and I'm looking forward to this because I've heard it being practiced, and it's brilliant. I love this wee song, and it's, it's really lively. So hope you, you join in at home, and it's Who's the King of the Jungle. enjoyed that at home. I hope you enjoyed singing that along with your parents as well. Turn with me now please to the scriptures, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to continue uh, in that chapter this week. Uh, Last week we looked uh, at that wonderful gift of of, of faith, of salvation by grace from God. Uh, We were reminded last week that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy and because of his great love, he made us alive through Jesus Christ. We're going to finish chapter 2 off today, uh, picking up our reading at verse 11. This is the word of God Almighty. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, 
you who were once, or sorry, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us. And we know he blesses the reading of his precious truth. Amen. In recent weeks, the media has jumped from either the COVID crisis or has been reporting on the deep divisions that have blighted American society and have spread across the world. And as we look at what was going on over in the States across uh, the pond, it would be very easy for us to, to shake our heads, to tut and to point the finger at what has been taking place over there. But if we're honest... And if we're truthful, every society across the planet is blighted by such divisions, whether it's over colour, whether it's over creed, whether it's over culture or something else. Every society is a divided society. And you know, that's not a modern issue. It's not a a, a contemporary issue. It has existed throughout history. But it has been said that none has been more exclusive or remorseless than the division between the Jews and the Gentiles in biblical times. Back in biblical times, the Jews claimed that God had create, created the Gentiles to be fuel for the fires of hell. The Gentiles were not innocent by any means. They not only expressed a, a deep animosity towards the Jews, but for anyone who was not like them, The Greek philosopher Plato once said that the barbarians, non-Greeks, were his enemies by nature. Division has always existed. And the opening verse of the passage that we read together from from God's word uh, emphasizes the great alienation that existed, not between the Jews and the Greeks, although that is referred to here, but an even greater alienation between mankind and God Almighty. One version uh, has put the opening verse like this, do not lose sight of the fact that you were born Gentiles, known by those whose bodies were circumcised as the uncircumcised. Paul is trying to get his readers in the Ephesian church to remember their pre-Christian days. What the, the life that they lived in the past in order to give them a a greater appreciation and a a deeper understanding of all that God has done for them. You remember he's he's talked in the opening chapter about the, the spiritual blessings that have been given to us through Christ from before the creation of the world. He last week we looked, as I said, how we were dead in our trespasses, but God in his grace came and rescued this people. And he says, Therefore, therefore remember. Don't forget what you were like and how your lives have been transformed because of God's great mercy and grace. In fact, in verse 12 of the passage we read, Paul deals specifically with the the grave issue of the Gentile alienation from God. And he he points out five reasons why the the non-Jew was separated from from the God, the creator of all the, the world very briefly each one 
Firstly, they were separated from Christ. The Gentiles were not part of the people through whom God's Messiah would come. And and, and as a result, they had no expectation of a savior. They had no expectation or a realization that they had a need for one. Secondly, they were alienated from the commonwealth or the citizenship of Israel. They did not and could not belong to that nation which was created by God. Thirdly, the Gentiles were strangers to the covenants of promise. Someone said the Gentiles' exclusion from the community of God's people meant that they had no share in the covenant which promised messianic salvation. And then the, the f- number four and number five can be joined together. It says they had no hope and they were without God in the world. Friends, we are no different, or we were no different In our pre-Christian days, we were separated from Christ. We were not part of that chosen nation. We were strangers to the the covenants, the, the promises that God had made. We were without hope. We were without God. We were alienated, separated from our creator. Kent Hughes in his commentary on Ephesians says this, The Gentile dilemma, which is the world's dilemma, produces alienation from God and alienation from man with all its dehumanizing and debilitating results. Friends, we were born alienated, separated from God. But then Paul shows and goes on to explain how the Gentiles who were aliens and strangers were reconciled to God. And, and how they were reconciled to God is the answer for us today. How we can be reconciled to God as well. And that reconciliation takes place in no other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to verses 13 and 14 of Paul's letter. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Those who were alienated from God, in fact, alienated from each other, Jews and Greeks, those who were enemies of God, enemies of each other, were now one in Christ, united in Christ Jesus, reconciled unto God in Christ Jesus. He is our peace. Jesus is the one that brings peace between God and man. He is the one who has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility between God and man and man and man. And this image of a a dividing wall comes from the, the, the temple that used to exist in Jerusalem. In that temple, there was a wall which separated the the court of the Gentiles from the rest of of the temple. And on the wall were inscriptions such as this. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. But in Christ, he has destroyed that barrier. He has ripped down the barrier so that Jews and Gentiles alike have access to God and how are united spiritually speaking. They are now one people. And how did Christ do that? How did Christ break down the barrier between God and man? And how does he break down between fellow man? Well, the first half of verse 15 says, by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations. This law that has been spoken about here is is the ceremonial law, the the ritual washings, the requirement of circumcision, uh, the Sabbath restrictions, etc. These laws were a great barrier between the Jews and all the other nations around them. But with Christ's death, those ceremonial laws are are gone forever. They were fulfilled in Christ. And we do not need to follow them anymore. As one commentator said, the ultimate answer to vertical and horizontal alienation is not intellectual or political or social, but spiritual. 
The answer comes when we cross the broken barrier and thus come near to God and then near to each other. We were alienated from God and from each other. But we can be reconciled firstly to God and then to each other through Christ. And what is the outcome of of being reconciled in Christ to God and to each other? Well, verse 19 says, You are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Those who were once alienated, those who who were once enemies, those who were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, godless, have had their status dramatically changed. Jesus has made a a, a new humanity, a new man, or a new society, as it has been described. And this wasn't a a, a hybrid creation. Jesus didn't make the human equivalent of the the Toyota Prius. He didn't make the Jews half Gentile and the Gentiles half Jews. He made them all completely new people. A new creation, as 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says. The old is gone and the new has come. Friends, if we have come to Christ, if we have been reconciled unto God in Jesus, if we have been saved by grace through faith, then there should be no resemblance of the old person we used to be. We are to be completely new people, living in a completely new society, by completely new standards. In the second century, Clement of Alexander wrote, we who worship God in a new way as the third race are Christians. We are to be different from everyone else around us. And Paul in this letter goes on to describe this third race as Clement of Alexander describes it. And he he uses three, three images Firstly, we are fellow citizens with the saints, or God's people, as we see in verse 19. As I said, the Gentiles were once alienated from God's nation, but now, because of Christ's death, they belong to God's chosen people, his special people. Yahweh, the great God of the Jews, the great God of all creation, was now their God. And all the promises and the blessings that were promised to Abraham centuries before were now being poured out upon the Gentiles, this formerly alienated people. Secondly, if we are the third race, we are Christians, we become members of the household of God. We are part of God's family. We are his sons and his daughters. We are no longer his enemies. People of every race, class, and origin are now brothers and sisters in Christ. We are one family under the fatherhood of God, a good good father someone has said a family shares things like dreams hopes possessions memories smiles frowns and gladness a family is a clan held together with the glue of love and the cement of mutual respect a family is shelter from the storm a friendly port when the waves of life become too wild no person is ever alone who is a member of the family and that should be the picture of what it means to be in god's family And do you know what? I think some people are realising what it means to be the family of God now that we have been separated because of this COVID crisis. And I hope that's one thing we've learnt and it will change how we, we act as a congregation when we can come back together. Thirdly, uh, as Christians, as, as this new society, this new race, we are a dwelling place uh, for God. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one. We see that in verses 20 and 22. For a long time, the temple had been the focus of, for the Jewish people because in the Holy of Holies is where God uh, pr- made his presence known and the high priest was only allowed to go in once a year. But with the creation of this third race, of this new society, and there was a new temple, a new dwelling place for God. Uh, and Paul uh, lists three elements to this new temple here in this chapter firstly this new temple had a good foundation verse 20 says it would be built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in other words very simply this new temple was built upon god's word 
And you know yourself, if you're a builder, and I'm not a builder, but I do know this, if we mess around with the foundations of a building, it will crumble and collapse. And likewise, the church, the church stands or falls on us loyalty to the truth of the word of God. If we mess with it, if we do not live by it, then the church will cease to exist because we have tinkered with the foundations. Secondly, Paul says, and just as important as the foundation upon which the church is built is the cornerstone. The cornerstone, when buildings went up in biblical times, determined the stability and the character of the building. It was the first one that was laid. And the stability and character of God's new temple is determined by Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. And friends, everything we do as the church, everything we do as individuals must be determined by Christ. We must always look to his example. We must always listen to his teaching as we find it in the word of God. And upon his example and his teaching, we must build our lives. We must conduct our activities according to his guidance, his leading. Friends, the beliefs and the practices of the church should be based on nothing else, not the man-made traditions of the past or the present trends of what's happening in society, but the beliefs and the practices of the church must be based on Christ and Christ alone. He must be our chief cornerstone. Or once again, the church will just collapse and cease to be. And thirdly, the final component of the new temple is the, the type of building blocks with which it will be built. We see that in verses 21 and 22. And this image is also used by Peter in his first letter where he says this, as you come to him, that is Jesus, the living stone, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Gentiles were once excluded from the inner courts of the Jerusalem temple, but now because they are in Christ, they are key components of God's new temple. Because God's new temple, which is the church, is not made up of bricks and mortar, but people. And friends, why we, it's useful to have buildings like the one I am standing in at the minute, somewhere where we can come and we can meet and we can hold our various activities this is not the church. I've said this before, and it's a mantra which I'm going to hammer time and time again from this pulpit. This is not the church. And friends, we need to get away from our obsession with buildings and all that goes with them. We need to stop talking about going to church, referring to coming to this place. We need to stop talking about going to church, referring to going to a Sunday service. Because friends, according to, to what Paul says here, according to what Peter says here, we are the church, the people of God. We are the living stones that build this new temple. Church is not a building and it's not an activity. It is you and me if we belong to Christ. And friends, we need to start being the church because we need to remember that Christ shed his blood for people and not property. And you know what's even more amazing is this. God placed his presence, as I've said, in the Holy of Holies of the old Jerusalem temple. But this new temple, the church, this living church, God has placed his presence in us. He lives within you and me if we belong to Jesus. One commentator has said this, in Ephesians 2, the temple is God's heavenly abode, the place of his dwelling, yet that temple is his people in whom he lives by his spirit. Do you get that? The God of all creation, the God who, who flung the stars into space, who is the king of the jungle, who, who holds everything in his hands, 
dwells in you and me if we belong to him. That blows my mind. I just can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend that. But that's the truth. And if we talk to the church about being a building or activity, then we are thinking far too small. We are missing out on what God is creating. We are missing out on this amazing truth that we are his church. And that he dwells by his spirit within us. We are so poor if we don't get that picture of what the church really is. We are missing out on the blessing of God. Folks, meditate upon that. Read that passage. Read 1 Peter. We are the church. And the king of the church lives within us. As we come to an end, I want to quote from John MacArthur, uh, a Baptist from the United States. He says this, Through the blood, the suffering flesh, the cross and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, aliens become citizens, strangers become family, idolaters become the temple of the true God, the hopeless inherit the promises of God, those without Christ become one in Christ, those far off are brought near, and the godless are reconciled to God. Therein is the reconciliation of man to God, and of man to man. Friends, what a wonderful hope we have What a wonderful society we can be part of, all because of one man, all because of the man who gave his life upon the cross, all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if you're still aliens from God, will you come to him and receive that free gift that he wants to give us and be reconciled unto God and become part of his family and know the joy of being part of his eternal kingdom? If you do know Christ, if you have trusted in him, have you grasped that amazing blessing it is to be his church and to have him dwell within us forevermore? Amen. And we thank God for his word and we thank God for his salvation. As we turn to prayer, we're going to again use the Let's Pray bulletin that that comes out week by week and and just use a couple of the, the prayer points that we're asked to think about this week and to seek God's face over. So let's bow in prayer together. Sovereign and and gracious Father in heaven, as we we come to you in prayer, our minds continue to be consumed by by, by the COVID crisis that is gripping our world and, and, and is causing us to conduct our services of worship in this way. And we wonder, will it ever come to an end? Will this second wave hit us uh, and and therefore cause us to continue with all the restrictions that have been placed upon us. And Father, it is overwhelming. It is exhausting. And so, Father, we pray for those who have indeed found this lockdown exhausting because they have had to uh, pick up extra responsibilities in one way or another, whether it's at home, uh, looking after children, educating them at home, maybe having to do more at home because loved ones have been on the front line and working longer hours or maybe not able to come home for safety reasons. Maybe they're in that working environment, Lord, which has placed great emotional and physical demands upon them. Father, we pray for those who are exhausted, those who feel mentally, emotionally and physically drained, that you, by the power of your spirit, would renew their strength of body, mind and soul. And as we enter into summer months, Lord, when when, uh, things seem to be settling down and there seems to be less pressure on our our health services and on other essential uh, services, Lord, we pray that those who are exhausted would find a time of rest, a time of refreshment, a time of recuperation. Father, we also want to pray, think of those who have been found this lockdown these last few months frustrating as, as they've been unable to go to work, maybe because they've been furloughed, or maybe they've been having to shield because of health reasons, uh, either con- in connection with themselves or with a family member. Those who maybe have been unwell, who have been affected by this virus, 
or those who are experiencing the angst of waiting for, for guidance, for hope to be able to see family and friends again. We ask that you would encourage them, you would motivate them, you would re-energize their lives and, and give them patience to wait for that time when they can do what they are desperately wanting to do. And fill their hearts and minds with peace to know that you are in charge, you are in control, and you know what the future holds. But Father, while life has been challenging and worrying for us here, Father, we want to pray for those in other countries who are, who are battling this virus without all the resources and support networks that we have. People who do not have the, the medical back, backup, the medical expertise that we have been blessed with. For people who are living in, in lands where they do not have the financial resources that, that we have had in this country to, 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 to furlough workers and to keep paying them until businesses can open up again. For those who are living in lands that are suffering from the devastation of years of conflict and conflict which is continuing and all the implications that that has for their wider society. Father, we pray for Tear Fund and other relief organizations that they would have the resources and also the access to reach those people in those sorts of countries who are much poorer than ours and reach the people who are in the greatest of needs. We also pray for governments and other global organizations, Lord, that that while resources are being stressed in, in, in home countries, that they may have a, a moral and ethical issue to, to show compassion to those who are in immense poverty, who are in incredibly difficult situations. Father, we thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you for your mercies that are, that are new every morning. Father, may we never take for granted what we have and the lives that we enjoy and above all, the wonderful spiritual blessings that you have lavished upon us in Christ. And Father, may we always be prepared to share with others the hope that is within us and point others to Jesus, who will be their hope. And we pray all these things and we, we leave them with you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Folks, thank you once again for, for tuning us in this week. I hope you've been blessed. I hope you've been challenged. And certainly I was rebuked and challenged as I worked my way through that passage. And as always, we're here to help in whatever way we can, whether it's to talk about the scriptures and talk about our relationship with Christ or maybe there's some practical need that, that you need help with. Please, please never be afraid to give us a call. And if we can help you, we certainly will. And we look forward to you tuning in again next week as we bring you another service uh, next Sunday. Our closing praise today reminds us uh, that if we belong to Christ, if we are in Jesus, if we are part of this new society, if we are part of his uh, new eternal kingdom, then we have nothing to fear of this life or the life to come. Because as one of the verses of this song we're going to sing says, though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the Saviour King. Then my joy complete standing face to face in the presence of the Ancient of Days.
And now may grace, mercy and peace from God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each of us now and then forevermore. Amen. Thank you.